Welcome to our third installation of our sustainability deep dive series presented in partnership with the council and the marijuana industry group here in Colorado. I'm Ben Gelt, the founder and board chair of the council, and I'm really excited to be presenting this great content from our experts, Whitney, Dan, and Suzanne. And I'm super excited to welcome Kat Kodaspoti from the marijuana industry group to also welcome you and introduce our speakers. Hey, Kat. Hi everyone. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm Kat and I'm the membership coordinator for MIG. Um, we're so excited to have you guys here today and uh, be able to learn and grow together. Our hope is that you guys can take something actionable away from today's event and continue to do your best to incorporate more sustainable practices in your businesses. I want to thank Ben, uh, the Cannabis Council, and of course our speakers for all of their hard work and willingness to share their expertise with us. Um, we're su super lucky to have them here, so just want to say thanks. Um, additionally, I just want to uh, say that if you have interest in MIG membership, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so with that, we have Dan Banks. Fantastic. So my name is Dan Banks, and I am the Vice President of Cultivation for Lightshade Labs here in Denver, Colorado. We're a vertically integrated cannabis operator with five cultivation facilities, including a greenhouse and four indoor grows, uh, and then 10 dispensaries in the Denver area. Um, I graduated from CSU in 2012 with a degree in horticultural science and a minor in entomology. Um, have worked in the cannabis industry since that time and uh, very passionate about IPM and also very excited to be um, talking with you guys today and uh, uh, have Suzanne Wainwright Evans, the uh, the bug lady, and then Whitney Cranshaw, one of the, uh, the uh, you know, best living entomologists um, with us here. And so what we're going to start with is a brief introduction into what IPM is. And then uh, after that, I'm going to be focusing on some tips for responsible pesticide use and uh, some other things related to pesticides. So simply put, IPM is a proactive and multifaceted approach to pest management grounded in applied ecology. There's a lot of definitions used, but what I'm trying to get across there is that it's um, multiple strategies applied to pest management. And it's very important to understand the biology of your crop the biology of the pest organisms that might be affecting it, and then also how all of those things are influenced by the environment. And then in that way, you're able to kind of pull apart the um, life cycle of the pest and also match that up against your crop and figure out the most advantageous ways to deal with pests. Um, with IPM, it's important to recognize that there's no silver bullets and that uh, you need to combine multiple approaches. And it's also a very proactive thing. So start thinking about what you can do to prevent problems. And then hopefully you don't find yourself having to play catch up and do a lot of reactive things. Um, very briefly, uh, in Cannabis IPM, we start with pest monitoring and identification. And then we look at things that are structural and environmental controls. So how is your environment being modified to um, you know, both exclude pests, but then also create a very healthy crop? Uh, and then also cultural practices, which are the ways that you're pruning, the ways that you're watering, what you're doing for nutrients, resistant varieties. Um, that's something that uh, I think you'll see more of with cannabis over the next decade or so, but certain varieties are more resistant than others to certain pests. Biological controls, so using the uh, you know good bugs to fight the bad bugs, if you will. And uh, I know that our other speakers are going to dive into that much further. And then compliant and responsible pesticide use, which is what I'm going to be focusing on a little bit more. So one of the things to understand when you're using pesticides and cannabis is that control strategies are going to vary dramatically by age because in the vegetative stage, there's certain products that we can use both from a compliance and a plant health standpoint that cannot be used in the uh, flowering stage. And then you also have some unique crop and cultivation environments. And finally, compliance is, is key. You have to make sure that you're um, being in compliance with all of the state regulations and each state market is a little bit different. So we'll talk about uh, how to stay on the right side of things in Colorado specifically. Um, and so with responsible pesticide use, you're wanting to use products and techniques that maximize damage to pests while minimizing the risk to your crop, your employees, and your consumers. Uh, always operate within the compliance framework of your jurisdiction, and then always read the pesticide label before you do anything with the pesticide. 
Uh, and then in terms of compliance, two resources that I wanted to get out there to folks are the Colorado Department of Agriculture's um, website uh, on pesticide use in cannabis. There's a ton of great resources there, and they're the primary enforcement agency for worker protection standard compliance here in Colorado. And the worker protection standard is a federal regulation that basically ensures that workers um, that are in facilities that are using pesticides for agricultural commodity production are safe. And so there's a variety of things that need to be done with that. And so the second resource I've got here, the Pesticide Educational Resources Collaborative, is a great resource to complement the CDA's website. And it gives a lot of training materials. You can also pull the Worker Protection Standard Compliance Guide from there. So for anybody using pesticides, um, you know, I would definitely recommend uh, using both of those resources to better understand how to be compliant here in Colorado. So the uh, pesticide selection here in Colorado, we have a curated list that the Department of Agriculture puts out that lists the various products that can be used compliantly in cannabis. And what I would encourage folks to do is get in there, look at that list and start with active ingredients not brands. And as you're doing scouting, as you're identifying the pests that you're dealing with, um, there's a lot of uh, information out there. And I always encourage folks when they can to go to uh, university websites. Um, there's the, uh, the Colorado State University um, Hemp Insect Project is uh, something that um, Dr. Cranshaw curates that is a really good resource here in Colorado. There's some other great resources and always cross-reference what you're seeing there with our pesticide approved list. But look at the active ingredients that are going to be effective against pests. And then um, I try to give folks to give preference to traditional ag manufacturers that are offering products that are available for use in the cannabis market, as opposed to, um, you know, steering towards companies that have popped up um, as cannabis has started to kind of take hold across the states and are doing a lot of uh, 25B pesticide marketing um, and really quick Broadly, in cannabis, we've got EPA-registered products that are on that list, and that means that they've gone through a stringent federal registration process that includes efficacy and safety testing. And then you've got 25B products, and 25Bs contain active ingredients that are found by the federal government to be safe enough that they don't need to go through the whole process. But the thing to understand about 25B is that because they don't go through that process, you're really just going off of the word of the manufacturer in terms of efficacy, safety, et cetera, as opposed to being able to lean on that EPA registration. So if you are gonna be using 25B products, I would recommend going to some of these traditional ag manufacturers that have been putting products out for a long time. So JH Biotech has some good ones that are 25B, Brandt has a few as well. And then the other um, manufacturers that I've listed here have a lot of great products that are relevant to um, cannabis production as well. And if I have enough time on the presentation, I'll just start jumping through some active ingredients. Um, and so when we're looking at practices to increase the effectiveness of pesticide applications, combine and rotate multiple modes of action. And the mode of action is how that is actually targeting the pest. And so with certain products, um, you can actually lead to uh, pesticide resistance in the pest population if you continually hammer them with the same thing. One example I like to give with that is uh, pyrethrins, which there's organic pyrethrin products that we can use in cannabis. Um, and if you're using those, say, for uh, aphid control, for instance, um, if you're just constantly using pyrethrins and you're not rotating anything else in, that can lead to pesticide resistance in the population. Whereas if you rotate those with other products or combine those with other products in a tank mix, then you can reduce the chances of resistance development because you're hitting that pest with different means of control. Uh, and then also look at applying pesticides with proper equipment and at sufficient volumes to increase contacts with pests. I've got a few different uh, graphics on the bottom here, but we've got an atomizer. We've also got a DRAM um, fogger. There's also uh, another company, Sebring, that makes some really good pesticide application equipment for the industry. Oftentimes I'll see people using paint sprayers and um, the thing with paint sprayers is that they're not designed for pesticide application. And so you're gonna have more efficacy and more reliability if you're using something that is specifically designed for pesticide application. Uh, and then also look at practices that are gonna minimize plant damage. So make sure your plants are well watered, um, that if you're in an indoor cultivation facility, you've turned off your lights uh, prior to the applications. 
make sure that you're testing any mixes on a small area before doing widespread applications. And then also look at your environmental parameters. You don't want to be applying pesticides if things are very hot or very cold. Typically, if you're around 70, 75 degrees, that's a pretty safe range. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is looking at um, rinse-aids. And so a, a rinse-aid is really any leftover pesticide when you're cleaning equipment. So you're gonna have a little bit leftover at the end of any spray. And then there's also um, you know, mixed pesticides. If you have excess, those need to be applied to a labeled crop or site. Um, they can't go down the drain. That's a, a huge environmental issue. And it's also a, a big uh, compliance issue. And so that's something that I often see is poorly addressed in company protocols is, what do we do with this leftover pesticide? What do we do with this rinse aid? So what you can strategize to do is to actually get as much of that as possible put out on the crop that you're applying to. And a lot of people will come and they'll say, well, you know, what if I'm putting something to loot out? This is, uh, you know, I don't wanna reduce the efficacy of what I'm doing. And so typically if you're kind of putting things out at the end that might be a little bit diluted with water, I recommend going back to where you started the application and just kind of getting those out on um, some of the plants in that front area and looking at being able to watch those closely to see if there's any issue. But um, you wanna make sure that you're getting those things applied. And if you don't have uh, a means to apply that or say you've got a, a mismix or something like that, you can't pour pesticides down the drain. It's, uh, you know, it's a, a big deal. We don't wanna be poisoning our uh, municipalities or poisoning the environment around the facility. And so an, an alternative, and one of the things that we do at Lightshade is we work with AET Environmental, which is a hazardous waste company here in Denver. Um, and we actually have uh, disposal barrels at all of our sites. So if we do have any excess pesticide or we have something that is a mismix or there's you know, rinse aid issues, any of the above, we can put that into the barrel and then have that company come out and they'll compliantly um, and responsibly dispose of it. I also listed hazardous waste experts because they service uh, different cities nationally. And so if you're outside of the Denver area, they're also a good resource for that. Um, and then as we're kind of uh, wrapping things up for my portion, I wanted to run through and just do some active ingredient highlights to piggyback on what I mentioned earlier in terms of going after specific pests with specific active ingredients. And so um, when we're looking at different types of pesticides, we've got biofungicides. And so those are um, pesticides that are based on fungal organisms. There's numerous bacillus species that are useful both in plant pathogen um, prevention and in also combating um, some pest species. So there's a uh, Bacillus thuringiensis um, crusticiae, I'm probably butchering the, the K there, but uh, that is a product that's really good for chewing insect control. So for outdoor producers, that's an awesome one. Another biofungicide that I'd like to highlight is the various trichoderma species that are out there for um, prevention of uh, root-borne pathogens. And then getting into, uh, you know, Bavaria vassiana, which is one that is really good for root aphid control. Um, and then we've also got the uh, active ingredient for the product Grandivo that's put out by Marone Bioinnovation. That's the, uh, the last one listed under bioinsecticides. And that's another uh, product that can be really good as a, uh, you know, kind of a, a control for chewing insects because you put it out on the leaf, they ingest it, and then it's a stomach poison. Getting into other uh, highlights, I, I wanted to talk briefly about azadiractin. That's an insect growth regulator. So it is going to be something that's very useful for uh, various foliar pests and then also for, for root aphids. Um, pyrethrins are, uh, are one that is a, a good go-to for certain insect pests, uh, although you have to be careful with not using that um, into the flowering cycle because there could be some testing issues. And then I also note to lose the uh, PBO, which is pipenyl butoxide. That's a synergist that's sometimes put in non-organic pyrethrin products and recommend people don't use that because it's a known carcinogen and it also sticks around um, and can be something in certain state markets that can pop up on testing. And then you've also got horticultural soaps, various horticultural oils, and uh, various botanical oils as well. And the, very, the manufacturers that I had mentioned earlier in the presentation are all good sources for these various products. 
And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of close my portion and hand it over to the other folks. But um, I've got my, uh, my information listed here if anybody has any questions or would like to discuss things further. And we'll also have the uh, Q&A to kind of run through some things as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne. All right. Well, um, thanks for having me. Um, this is kind of a, a, a short, sweet shot in the arm of pest management today. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about getting started um, with biocontrol and a few other pest management um, issues that I've uh, been dealing with in the industry. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've actually had my consulting business now 21 years. Um, I've actually been in the industry just over 30, I think at this point, I did um, go to the University of Florida and got degrees in entomology and environmental horticulture because I was trying to become more of a, a well-rounded uh, industry person, even though my whole focus is on entomology. I do work out, work through the U.S., internationally, Europe, down through the Caribbean, I think Grenada is the furthest south I've gotten. Um, and what I do basically is I help people solve pest issues. And I um, what I think is, is very helpful is since I get into a lot of different kinds of facilities through different industries, I get to see a lot of different things and try to bridge that information through a lot of these different industries. So when it comes to biocontrol, which is my first love and you may say obsession, um, is it right for your facility? Because biocontrol is not right for everybody. Um, one of the first things that's really important is you have to really be committed uh, to taking time to identify really what your problem is. And I'm still kind of amazed at the number of facilities I go to and they don't have a solid scouting program um, in place where they're taking time to identify the insects and really figure out what's going on. They're still operating a little, little bit under the, we're just not gonna do anything until it's so bad or um, for some people, we do what we call the spray and pray program that uh, you do put out pesticides and hope what you're doing is gonna work. Another thing that I always look at, and this is true for ornamentals, cannabis, herbs, or any other industry I work in is the economics. Um, because if a pest management program is not economical, then it's not gonna work for you. And I've seen pretty insane budgets for biocontrol in the cannabis industry. And it doesn't need to be that way, but it's important you do look at the economics to make sure it is gonna be feasible. And also pesticide compatibility. Um, so we do have to look at a spray products and things people forget about is things like even fungicides. Fungicides can have impacts on beneficial insects and predatory mites. So you really have to go through everything you're spraying out and to see if your biocontrol agents can work into that program or if there are options for the spray products that you are using. One of the other big problems though, is there a beneficial for your pest problem? We do not have biocontrol agents for every pest out there and we don't have economical pest solutions for every pest out there. So it's important to look at what we can do and what we can't do. And this is kind of a, a broad list um, and this kind of encompasses all crops. Um, but we know we can absolutely manage fungus, gnats, thrips, and I highlight western flower and onion in here, which are a bit more of um, an issue these days. Asterisk on the aphids because not all species but numerous um, We've got options for white flies, spider mites, broad mites, caterpillars, again, depends on species and situation and even leaf miners. Where, when it comes to things we don't have, there are options for mealybugs out there, but they're not very economical. Root mealybugs, we don't have biocontrol agents for, root aphids, borers, psyllids, plant hoppers, flea hoppers, scales, and hemp resin mite. We really don't have good biocontrol options for these pests. So you kind of have to look and see Again, if, if, if there is even a biocontrol option for you. You also have to think about the needs of the beneficials. Some beneficials have specific lighting requirements. Others have certain temperature requirements. Um, we have found some wiggle room on temperatures because through the years of doing this, um, I think the most classic example is with Phytocelius persimilis. All literature says, you know, 85s, it's cut off, but we still um, have been able to successfully use it in um, facilities like in Florida, where in the day it will get up over 100, but it's cool enough in the evenings and nights that they'll work then. Also, 
the fact of folding and humidity with temperature relationships, we can get a little more wiggle room with some of the beneficials in there. We're also looking at alternate food sources for your beneficials to help keep them alive because we can feed some beneficials, pollen, dead moth eggs, and things like this that then will help keep your beneficials alive if you don't have enough food for them or if you're missing part of their diet because like Aureus up in the top there, um, it needs pollen in its diet to reproduce. And generally you don't have pollen available in a cannabis grow. So we find ways to provide that for them so that then they can reproduce and we can build a population. As far as growing methods, we also have to look at this very closely when making decisions on biocontrol or even pest management, because how I approach outdoor biocontrol for cannabis is different than, let's say, a fully enclosed greenhouse or a hoop house with the sides that roll up. Um, th there's so many variables, and that's generally why there's not one answer that fits all, but you have to take these into consideration. And when you're working with somebody on pest management, you have to talk to them about this. If you call somebody and you say, I have this problem and they don't ask you how you're growing, what do you know, all these kinds of questions, you really need to find somebody else because all these, how you grow makes decisions on what methods we are going to use and what biocontrol agents we can use. But first and foremost, and anybody that knows me knows this is one of my biggest, biggest things. I I harp on all the time. You have to identify really what your problem is. It is really critical to do that. The problem we're facing today is the internet. You love it and hate it at the same time. Cannabis has hijacked the internet with pest management stuff. Um, so when you do a search, so many cannabis website comes up, but this is the problem. So on this first image here, spider mites on weed guide to um, uh, identification and mitigation. So that's not a spider mite in that picture. That's actually a whirly gig mite. That's a predator. On the right, this is from a document that's been floating around on Facebook that comes up in a lot of the groups. This is a document to tell a winged root aphid from an adult fungus gnat, and those are actually both fungus gnats in that picture. But I still have people using this document to try to identify their pests, and the, that is not a winged root aphid on the bottom. And again, growers are trying to use these tools. This top picture here, broad mites on cannabis. Those are two spot spider mites. The article on destroying root aphids in cannabis, those root aphids are not the species we're dealing with in cannabis. And people are getting very confused because they see white colored mites in their soil and now they think they have root aphids. And the image on the right is from a, a catalog for biocontrol agents and it's talking about spider mites. And that's actually a true bug in that picture. It's not even closely related. So, you know, you've got growers confused. How do you identify things? Well, let me ask for help on Facebook. And this is classic Facebook right here. You know, you've got this dead insect and someone's like, well, the fast movers are usually the good guys. Then again, they might be fungus canats, which that's not how you spell gnats, but don't rely on Facebook identification for your stuff because so much of this is, is wrong on there. You've got to look for good solid information. Who owns the website that you're getting information from? Um, Colorado State, this website, Hemp Resource Central, they have good pictures because Whitney knows what he's doing. And so he can provide you good information. Um, you wanna look for images that are well captioned that can show different life stage, geographic distribution. Is this even a pest in your area? Um, and so you have to look at all these things to decide if the website is actually going to be able to help you. Unfortunately, there are very few, but I'd consider good pest management uh, websites available today. But again, the university are the ones that are better to stick with because they are vetted by trained professionals out there. So please stick to the university websites. Now, if you do have a problem, there's a lot of other things we have to look at in making these decisions. So, one problem we have is, is if you Google this problem. So let's say you have spider mites in hemp, okay, and you want to find an answer. So you go to Google, you type it in, and the first thing that comes up is spider mites and cannabis, how to identify and how to get rid of them. 
This is literally the recommendation from the website to use the no pest strips, which are an organophosphate pesticide that are not to be used around people or animals. And they're also recommending fluoramite, which is not labeled for cannabis or hemp at this point. Um, and I know there's the whole discussion about, well, no EPA registered products are registered for cannabis. Some are registered for hemp, but still states are not gonna allow the use of fluoramite. But this is the kind of answers we're getting um, when you're looking out there. And you need to be able to find good information. We're also, when making this pest management decision, we have to look at population densities. Um, if you have a pest population like on the left, biocontrol in this situation is not going to be able to catch up, where if you just have a few aphids, it possibly can't if you've got the right beneficial and the right pest. And this is where when we have these heavy populations, we may need to come in and use a softer product to get the density knocked down before we release the beneficials. So getting good information, looking at your population density and picking the right solution. So for back to our spider mite issue, if you have to spot spider mites, really one of the best answers out there is this predatory mite Phytocelis persimilis. I put all these different pictures up to show all the different ways you can buy persimilis these days. And there's so many ways to release that we're doing with blowers, with sprinklers, with nipple top vials, with drones, by hand, straight persimilis in the top right hand. So, I mean, there's so many different ways to do it. You have to make sure you get the right application method for your growing system. These are discussions you need to have with whomever you're buying your beneficials from um, when you're doing that. But when you interact with these people and you're trying to get information, how do you know if the recommendations are good or part of this bro science culture, which I, I feel like I combat every day in this industry? So you really have to think. The first thing, does it make sense? When somebody says their product only kills bad bugs or bad insects and doesn't kill the goods, pesticides are not sentient. They can't say, hmm, I think you're good, you're bad, so I'm gonna eat you and not you. It doesn't work that way. Most of these broad spectrum products are indiscriminate, soaps, oils, things like that, and they will kill good and bad. And that's what the challenge is, is most of these 25B products and these softer environmental products are non-selective. So be careful about that. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There is no magic silver bullet for controlling pest problems. The combination of cultural practices, proper identification, deciding if biocontrol agents are right for you or not, deciding when it's right to spray. And this is another thing that's really essential. Who's providing this information? Are they really qualified to provide you this information? It, we're still kind of in the gold rush era. Of, of cannabis right now. And there are so many companies selling so many products and everybody's trying to, you know, jockey for a position in the industry. And that's why, you know, mentioned before, going with the more traditional horticultural supply companies that have experience working in agriculture um, often tend to provide very good solid information um, because they're looking at the long haul of building relationships and having customers for long term, not just get in to make a buck and get out. Also, when you look at recommendation, is it because they're just trying to sell you a product? And when they tell you something, is the information, has it been published? Has it been peer reviewed? Um, and you can find the information in multiple sources to back up what people are saying. You, I mean, I hate to say it, but you just can't trust what somebody necessarily tells you. I don't, I research what people say. I talk to other people that work in the field and try really to make sure the information is, is good, sound and science-based. So I really recommend when you are gonna do Google searches, use Google Scholar that brings up university websites, even though you may not find specific articles on pests with cannabis. There are some, but you can find a lot of biology information about beneficials and a lot about the pests that we know um, is true. And then you can also find a lot of screening for a lot of these insecticidal and pesticidal uh, products. Extension websites are getting better with more cannabis information slash hemp. So that information is slowly coming 
And the other thing I highly recommend is you need to have a biocontrol buddy. I would love to be everybody's buddy, but I can't. Um, there's only one of me to go around. There are some really great qualified people in this industry, and I'm not you know, I'm sure someone's going to contact me like, why is my picture not in there? But these are just a few people, you know, Kelly Vance, Ron Valentine, uh, Michael Brownbridge, Julie Gresh, Paul Cool, and, uh, and, and these guys are all well qualified. Oh, I forgot Steve in the middle, Stephen authors in the middle there. These people are all qualified, been working in the industry a long time and can provide good, solid information and sounding boards and help if you need it. So with that said, that's my 15 minutes. Um, there's all my contact information if you need it. Um, and hopefully we can take some questions here at the end. And I'm going to stop sharing and hand this off to Whitney, who is an amazing entomologist. Um, and I'm really excited to hear his presentation. So the uh, um, in the time I've got, uh, I, I think the the topic I'd like to talk about that I haven't ever done before is um, related diagnostics. So, so I, I just work with insects and mites. Um, and uh, uh, what I want to talk about is how these things actually feed on a cannabis plant. And then what kinds of things are you going to see expressed as a result of their feeding? So, um, you know, some insects and mites uh, would feed either on a solid or liquid diet, um, some chew some suck fluids. Um, the things that suck fluids are what we see in indoor cannabis. Um, and I am, I'm just focusing on indoor cannabis. If we, if we go outdoors, we go into hemp, uh, we've got a whole um, different scenario than what we'd see inside. But the kinds of things that would feed on plant fluids would be insects in the order Hemiptera, which would be in a indoor grow, uh, mostly represented by aphids, perhaps some white flies. Um, thrips and the spider mites and rust mites or russet mites. So the ones I want to try to hit today in the time I have is a little bit on canvas aphid, rice fruit aphid, two-spotted spider mite, hemp russet mite, and uh, onion thrips, uh, the key thrips that I see here in Colorado. What I don't have here is broad mite, and that's because I've never seen broad mite on cannabis. Uh, I, I, I visited some uh, cannabis operations since 2010 when my son used to work at a medical marijuana sh uh, uh, shop here in Fort Collins, but um, I've only had limited experience in uh, indoor grows, so I can't show you a broad bite. But basically, what you're going to see in terms of a response on a plant to insect feeding depends on where they feed and how they feed. So if you have a, a, a typical leaf um, you're going to have the you know, epidermis uh, the, on the top. You're going to have a lower epidermis on the bottom. You're going to have uh, the palisade uh, 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 mesophyll or and the spongy mesophyll. You're going to have uh, a vein, the vascular bundle that has the xylem and the phloem. Um, anyway, and so different uh, uh, of these uh, insects and mites feed uh, in different points. So just taking Hemiptera, uh, this is again a big uh, order, it includes leaf hoppers, which are extremely common outdoors. Um, uh, scale insects, white flies, the bugs, the true bugs, and of course the aphids. The only ones I'm going to talk about are aphids. So, all of these uh, uh, insects have what are called piercing sucking mouth parts. And the piercing sucking mouth part is extremely elongate. Um, uh, it, it's, it's what we call a stylet bundle. And uh, actually the thin part, the, the, the part that actually enters the plant is made of two uh, 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 different mouth parts, the mandibles and maxillae that are extremely elongated and, and uh, fit together to form what's called a stylet bundle. And then these are housed in what looks to us like a beak uh, which is another part of the mouth part. So, so this very thin area that I, I don't know if you can see where I'm putting the uh, little little uh, po uh, pointer right here, that's uh, thinner, far thinner than the hair on my head. That's actually four parts of the mouth part, totally thinned out uh, the interlock um, and uh, 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 allow them to penetrate through the plant. And you're gonna see some sort of beak uh, on the underside of the insects uh, that have this. So the stylet uh, of, the, of, a, of an aphid 
is used in a really uh, refined way to access the phloem uh, of the plant. They are going to feed on the fluids coming out of the phloem. And, and this shows a, uh, an aphid here on the left that's on the surface of a leaf with the proboscis, but down, if you do a cross section, there's the proboscis, the stylets are, are meandering through the plant and actually they're meandering between the cells. They, they essentially do no plant cell damage um, uh, in, in route to the phloem. And if they, once they hit the phloem, they can open up and then the fluids actually uh, move right into their body. I mean, through, uh, through pressure of the, of the phloem fluids. And, and they may stay there the rest of their life. They, they don't kill the cells because they want to stay in place and be fed. Why, once, they, once they've hit uh, uh, the big uh, uh, pay dirt here, why do you, uh, why do you want to move? Um, so uh, the, uh, the stylets are, are on the outside and they cut through and the, what we call the mandibles are on the inside, or the maxillae are on the, the mandibles are on the outside and the maxillae are on the inside and they form essentially a, uh, 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 interlocking structure that has a food canal through which the uh, fluids are going to flow into their body, and they also have a parallel salivary canal that pushes the fluids into uh, the salt saliva into the plant. So, the ultimate site of where aphids are feeding is that vascular bundle, uh, and they are going to go through either the top or the bottom, but they are going to go through um, between the cells. Now, one thing that you see associated with uh, aphids is a waste product, and this is called honeydew, and it is a, a, a clear fluid that's kind of sticky. Um, I think when many people have uh, seen honeydew, they, they see it uh, perhaps after they've uh, parked their, their vehicle under a, under a tree or something in the summer, and they come back and, and the, the windshield is all sparkly and a little bit sticky if you, if you look more closely. And, and typically people will, will say, oh, curse you tree for dripping sap on my, my car. Uh, uh, these, and here are some little sparkles of, of honeydew on a leaf. Uh, but, but what is on your car, what honeydew is, is, is not the tree dripping sap on you. It, it, it is fluids from that tree that were taken up by the aphid from the phloem and then ultimately have gone through the body of the aphid and last were seen at that point. And uh, what comes out of the butt end of an aphid or insects that feed in a similar manner, uh, we call honeydew. Uh, so these phloem feeding species uh, that tap into the phloem uh, will produce honeydew and they will produce very little, if any, cell injury. The injury you get from aphids is due to uh, effects when you have massive numbers over a prolonged time uh, uh, through uh, uh, loss of, of large amounts of fluid. Uh, there are some other issues potentially in terms of what the honeydew could do to the microfauna and flora on the surface of the leaf that has not been explored. Um, honeydew will be on could be on the buds, for instance, and uh, that's a sugar source, and that will cause development of certain microbes. From what I've seen uh, in the literature, the kind of microbes that grow on honeydew are not the pathogens. In fact, if anything, they may suppress pathogenic ones, but still uh, it will show up as having more uh, fungal spores uh, of, of some kind, whether or not they're uh, dangerous to us or not is a separate issue, but it could be a, a regulatory issue. Aphids, again, are not the only ones that produce uh, honeydew. There are other kinds of insects. All the insects that produce honeydew are in the order Hemiptera, uh, and they all feed on the phloem in a similar way. And again, the only other group that is an issue in cannabis, uh, in any indoor grown cannabis is white flies, and, and they're minor on the crop, I would say, very minor. Rice root aphid, though, is the other aphid, and you will not see honeydew. Rice root aphid is an extremely peculiar species that is shockingly uh, widespread in the cannabis industry throughout the United States. It feeds on the roots. Uh, for most of the time, you do not even see this insect because it is below ground. Uh, it seems to emerge and produce wing forms that disperse uh, uh, often after flowering has been induced. Um, but uh, this insect does not produce honeydew. It, it's found in the, in the roots. Um, 
and uh, uh, its issues are more related to uh, stressing the roots and, and perhaps uh, causing the plant to have uh, more susceptibility to certain kinds of root invading pathogens. By the way, uh, I just uh, uh, added this uh, after listening to Suzanne. Here is a picture of a winged rice root aphid on a, on a sticky card next to a fungus gnat. Um, so they are very different uh, looking. Now, the other kinds of things that uh, suck fluids are not insects, uh, or, or they're not uh, in the order of hemiptera, thrips and spider mites. So two-spotted spider mite is probably the most important uh, single kind of uh, uh, arthropod pest in, in indoor grows here in North America. This is an inst uh, a, a mite that is, is affects almost everything. Uh, has an enormous host range, most important spider mite on the planet. Um, and now the way a spider mite feeds is they have a kind of different mouth part. It's called a chalicery, uh, chalicera, and chalicery uh, are it would be the plural of the two stylets that they use and they use it to penetrate cells and then they remove cell contents. They're not a phloem feeder. Uh, and typically in any point where a spider mite settles and feeds, they will penetrate and remove the cell contents from uh, a couple of dozen cells. And these cells will then be emptied uh, of, of cell contents. So where these in, uh, animals feed is in the uh, parenchyma mesophyll area. Uh, they, they're not going to be uh, causing any kind of damage to the epidermis. Um, and often they will enter through the stomates. Um, sometimes if they do go through the surface, they're going to go between the cells, uh, but the cells that are damp between the epidermal cells, but, but the, the points of injury are going to be in the uh, uh, palisade pr uh, parenchyma, uh, in the spongy parenchyma uh, area of the mesophyll. So they're not going to be producing honeydew. Uh, they're not uh, going into the phloem. Uh, these uh, cells are emptied. They then appear uh, white uh, and uh, we see symptoms of that. So again, this shows the kind of entry points where the stylus would go in, but the area of feeding is going to be that uh, interior cells, the mesophyll parenchyma area. So each time they settle and feed, there are these you know, half dozen or a couple of dozen cells uh, that are damaged, and this will be reflected as a white spot, uh, something we call stippling. And if you have a lot of these white spots, it becomes more generalized in terms of the symptoms, but you'll see a white little fleck. Um, and in high populations, these stippling injuries may entirely cover uh, the plant and cause uh, essentially a bleaching uh, effect. Again, all of this is due to uh, massive destruction of individual uh, uh, cells in the uh, mesophyll parenchyma that have been emptied of cell contents. You do not see distortions. I mean, uh, these, these are just killing cells on the, on the leaf. This is, this is not a, uh, something you're gonna see a, a leaf curl. Um, light flecking is something you would see from the feeding of a, a spider mite. So again, stippling injuries, and they, again, they may cover. Oops, sorry, I repeated that. So um, what you need to do if you are surveying you know, your, your grow is catch these symptoms early. Uh, when there are a, just a small area has been affected, um, uh, get an eye for this. I mean, you know, it looks like it's got spider mites. It looks like there's, there's just a certain look to it and, and catch it before uh, it, it progresses to uh, more extensive damage and then before it's too late. Spider mites are way more able to be controlled often biologically or, or through certain sprays uh, if you catch it early. But if you don't, uh, uh, you can be in a, in a world of hurt, but looking at that little flecking that they cause from their feeding. Now, uh, hemp russet mite is an interesting animal that has been very little studied. Um, and when I uh, first uh, was trying to figure out what's going on with this, pretty much the only thing I could find were a couple of pictures in the wonderful website called Bug Guide that Carl Hillig had uh, uh, put up uh, back in 2009 when they were growing uh, 
some uh, cannabis for some purpose at Indiana University. Anyway, so there's a massive number of these uh, hemp russet mites there on the, the left. And the other uh, photo he had in Bug Guide, and it's still up, is, is this picture on the right that shows this kind of interesting little uh, curl around the uh, base of, of the leaves, these little slight roll of the leaves. So um, now, how, how russet mite feeds is, it is strictly uh, limited to the, um, uh, strictly limited to the epidermis. It cannot, um, uh, it, it, its mouth parts are so tiny, it could not reach into the underlying cells. So the only cells that are going to be affected are the epidermis. Um, so here's a sequence of cell injury by the, the uh, a, a russet mite. So in this picture, this is the, the mouth parts of the mite. It barely penetrates into a cell, but it does introduce uh, saliva that has effects on the cell. Uh, there's a little thickening that shows up there. And then uh, the effects of the feeding, the saliva that are introduced by the, the mite cause a gradual breakdown of the uh, nucleus the DNA of the nucleus, and ultimately it is going to be killed. Uh, the damage is pretty much limited to individual cells. Um, uh, the adjacent cell would have to be killed by a feeding puncture in that cell, and the underlying cells are not going to be affected. So you're not going to see the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, bleaching, the, the stippling, the, the white uh, 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 spotting uh, that you see with the two-spotted spider mite. Now, is an upward leaf curl a symptom of hemp russet mite? Um, uh, yes and no. I, I've I've looked at uh, a lot of hemp plants on this, and and there are some hemp plants that just have a genotype where they they roll up. Uh, they call it taco leaf, and uh, there's no mites on that. Uh, and in some uh, kinds of plants, I've seen. Uh, can have large numbers of hemp russet mite, and I don't see any kind of uh, 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 marginal leaf roll. So, populations, densities, and uh, population densities, location of the plant, and possibly cultivar may affect whether or not you're going to get that uh, leaf roll uh, condition. Uh, so, here are some um, hemp russet mites on a leaf, and I think the area that has to have lots of hemp russet mites to produce that upward leaf roll would be this, this base of the uh, leaf right here as it's just coming out. And there's by way a uh, predator that just, uh, that's feeding on them, um, uh, one that's not commercially available. But um, anyway, they're feeding on the developing leaves as they're coming out and that uh, by killing the cells of the epidermis at that point, you could get that little bit of roll. High populations, uh, on the upper leaf surface, concentrated in emerging leaves, I think are what could produce that leaf edge curl symptom. But again, don't count on that being something you're gonna see. Um, you're gonna have to look for hemp rust mites under a good scope. And uh, uh, Suzanne's got some good ideas, I'm sure, on, on how to do that. Um, what I see often is just a kind of a grayish cast. Um, uh, again, the, the epidermal cells have been destroyed, um, uh, so it looks a little grayer. It also tends to be a little more brittle uh, uh, if I have high numbers of hemp russet mites on my, on my hemp plants. And then as, as hemp russet mites uh, 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 feed on the plant, they, they tend to move up onto the new growth. If you have high populations, they've destroyed tissues in older leaves, so they keep moving up. And ultimately, they concentrate on the bud. And ultimately, that is where you get your big leaf loss. If all they did was feed on the leaves, that would be probably very minimal. But they feed on the developing buds, and that is uh, going to cause uh, impacts on yield. And the last one I would talk about is the onion thrips, which is the most common thrips I have seen on uh, hemp and uh, here in Colorado, there are others. Um, and the onion thrips is uh, an insect that is found on an enormous number of plants, indoors and outdoors. Uh, I've mostly worked on it in onions, but uh, it's uh, very common on, again, uh, a, the foliage of a large number of plants that grow here in Colorado. Um, and they have a different way of feeding on plant fluids. Thrips are strange, strange animals. Uh, they have 
uh, mouth parts, if you look at it, they kind of look at a little short cone on the underside of the, the uh, underside of the head. And within that, they have um, a single mandible that is essentially like a stout spike that is, uh, allows them to penetrate through the epidermis. And then they have a pair of maxillae that they then can use to penetrate further and puncture the cells below the surface. And then these pull it up. Uh, they work to pull up the fluids uh, and the labium also forms a supporting cone. So, so how I think of, of Thrips feeds is to puncture with the mandible, poke it uh, 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 and uh, puncture through the, the uh, epidermis, poke the low, lower cells then suck it up uh, with those uh, paired maxillae being supported with the labium. Most feeding injury is produced by the immature stages of thrips, um, and uh, the immature stages are going to be wingless. So the point of attack where they are going to go is going to be mostly, again, in the palisade parenchyma mesophyll area. Uh, they will go right through and also destroy the um, epidermal cells en route to those, unlike the uh, spider mites. And they excrete in the process of feeding on those cell contents, a uh, kind of uh, material that's pretty distinctive too. Um, thrips uh, cause silvery scarring of leaves, which is due to the cells being emptied by their feeding activity. And then they excrete these kind of uh, dark green, black, nearly black uh, fluid spots that then uh, darken. So they've got dark fecal spots, so silvery scars with dark fecal spots uh, uh, appear uh, as the symptoms. So here are some thrips injury symptoms uh, on, on some leaves, some hemp leaves, and again, kind of a scarring. If you look closely, you will see these uh, dark fecal spots uh, that I think are, are the real uh, key for separating this from say spider mites, which also cause uh, similar kind of injury. Spider mites, by the way, will produce a tiny bit of dark fluid uh, from their feeding, but much smaller. Even though a thrips is about as small an insect as you get, spider mites are considerably smaller than that. These, uh, these fecal spots we call tar spots. And again, there are other insects that produce them, but none that I think you're gonna see uh, on, uh, on hemp. Uh, but the, the silvery areas with the dark fecal spots are what you're gonna see with thrips. So, um, uh, that is all I have to say. Uh, do check out the Colorado State Insect website. Um, I do need to update uh, several parts of it, but uh, it's easy to get. Just do Hemp Insect website. I think it's the only thing that comes up still. Um, and if you ever have questions on this, I have my email uh, down there um, to contact me. I am uh, uh, retired from uh, CSU as of last July, but I am not retired from bugs. Uh, that's, that's my passion. Dan and Suzanne and Whitney, thank you again so much for each of your presentations. We have a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Um, so I'll just uh, read them and you guys can address them as you like. And then uh, certainly if you guys have comments or questions just internally amongst the three of you, I'm sure the audience would be happy to hear anything else on your minds. So the first question is, We've had trouble controlling cannabis aphids with beneficials and or organic pesticides indoors. Can you give recommendations based on personal experiences with this pest? My guess is you might get some questions about what is going on in the production method of production, et cetera. So if the person with that question maybe wants to add some more detail uh, that might help with answers, but um, just looking at my screen, it goes Dan, Whitney, Suzanne, uh, in that order, do you guys wanna take a bite at that question? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kind of open up there. So, um, you know, that's something that uh, that we've dealt with and that I've, I've dealt with in the past as well. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the first thing, if you're in a, an area where there's a lot of cultivation facilities, um, make sure that you've got, uh, you know, a means of kind of stopping things from coming in because that's a pretty ubiquitous pest these days. But in terms of uh, strategies in your vegetative phase, uh, horticultural soap, there's Impede and Desex are two brands that are available uh, and, and you know, able to be used here in Colorado. That's uh, an effective means of control. Typically, you're going to want to use something close to around 2%. Um, always check the label, but that's a labeled rate for both of those products. 
And then in addition to that, I would also look at, you know, maybe rotating that with uh, a horticultural oil and horticultural oils uh, like Suff Oil X or Trilogy, um, things like that can be tank mixed with azadiractin and pyrethrum products. And so those two strategies are both good ones for vegetative growth. What we've typically done is we'll use something like that vegetatively and then on into the first couple of weeks of flower. And then at that point, um, you know, pull back on pesticide applications and uh, aphidius colmani is a, a parasitoid that goes after aphids. And we found that to be useful. Um, there's several other parasitoid species that are out there too. And there's kind of active debate as to which one is the, the best for the cannabis aphid. Um, but I, I would look at using something like that because they'll kind of go out and if you still have pockets of aphids here and there and they're at a very low level, that can be helpful in going after those. But in addition to that, especially as you're getting into flower and things, the canopies are starting to close in. Um, scouting is really important because uh, Chrysopa is another beneficial, um, the green lacewing larvae that can be very good, but you've got to deploy it near aphid hotspots. You can also look at using um, you know, some, uh, some pesticides in a, kind of a spot treatment, um, capacity as well. Supoil X is one that works on into mid flower. Uh, we've also seen good success with Tetracurb, which is a, a 25 B that's a rosemary oil based product, but that tends to be a little bit more plant soft, um, and can be good for hot spots as well. So that would be just, you know, sort of practical advice, things to kind of look at. And with that, um, I'll kind of hand it over to the others to, um, kind of give some input as well. Suzanne, come on, you have to, you must have ideas on this. <laughs> well, yeah, well, first of all, I don't wait till vegetative. You have to start your program in propagation. You absolutely, and this is, you're giving them the weeks to build up from the start there. So you have to start your program in prop, um, and which kind of rolls into treating the mother plants and figuring out are are they coming in or on they on your mother, your stock plants and treating them there. Um, it, you know, Aphids are easy to kill, believe it or not. If you get the right product and the right concentration on them, which leads back to the paint sprayer, I don't know how to spray, using orchard sprayers for tree, I mean, um, that are designed for tree applications on cannabis, you're not gonna get the right amount of active product on there. So I find when we refine the actual spray equipment, and then use a good solid insecticidal soap, which is my preferred initial knockdown um, to, to get aphids down before we come in with the bios. Um, I, I think that that's kind of where to start. Um, also, you know, always check the ID on cannabis aphid because there's more foliar aphid species than just cannabis aphid. So this is where knowing where the person is, I mean, if you're left coast, most likely it's cannabis aphid. Um, right coast, eh, you could have some other options in there. And, and, and people get confused because we call it the cannabis aphid. So they assume any aphid on cannabis is the cannabis aphid, but that's that's a terrible you know, widget because we do have other foliar feeding species uh, like cotton melon that keeps popping up. Um, so on that, and when, then when it comes to the bios, um, I if you can get, their numbers knocked down in prop early vegetative start the bios then because the problem with the bios in flower is the trichomes develop and you can't really use lace wings you know far into flower and even the parasitoids get stuck in the trichomes and you know i wonder too about their ability to use their chemical cues to find um, their host because we've had issues with Encarcia and Aromoceros and cannabis being able to find their prey. Those are the white fly parasitoids. Um, so it, it's a challenge. And I will say, and I'm sure, you know, Whitney and I've discussed a lot about this, about the parasitoids, because what's weird is we're finding different pockets of parasitoids in different parts of the country. And I also think it has to do with the timing of the year and the differences between outdoor production grow production and then greenhouse production because of all the different lighting that's happening in different hours of photo periods. I also think there may have something to do um, 
with the size of the cannabis aphids. Um, because when you hear Europeans talk about the cannabis aphid, they tend to describe it as a smaller aphid. And in my book, yeah, exactly, Whitney. And so I'm starting to wonder if we have these different biotypes of Foridon. Um, and that's why we're seeing difference. Because even with the Colmani in California, some of my growers were only seeing like 30% um, parasitism rate in there. So it can be part of the puzzle, but there's no silver magic bullet. I will put out there if anybody watches this for New York, we're still looking for a trial site in New York State on hemp for a parasitoid that was found. Um, and we can only trial it in New York. It's a, a new species, um, but we can't find a site to do the trial at. So again, it's a combo program of knockdown spray parasitoids, but as Ben kind of, we have to know more details kind of on, on what's going on in that production facility, but it's challenging. There is no doubt. Whitney, did you want to speak to that question or we have a couple more that I'd just, like to- Just the only two things I want to say is uh, I, I re-echo the uh, uh, insecticidal soaps is probably the first choice for uh, uh, aphids. That's what I'd always go with uh, and they're cheap. And uh, um, there are several parasitoids. The one that I see sustaining itself in, in the few operations I've seen the best is Aphidius matricari, not uh, Colmeni and not- uh, uh, Irvine. I've seen all three of them will attack. We, we've re recorded all three of them out of cannabis aphid, uh, but uh, only uh, uh, Matricari for some reason. Just I mean, where you know the limited places I've seen that that seems to be doing a real good job. Anyway, thank you, Wendy. And so it'd be awesome if we could get stateside production of Matricari so we could have a better quality product here and get the pricing down because that's the other problem. It's so much more expensive than Colmani. People want to go in much higher rates of Colmani to keep the pricing down. Yeah, banker plants. We need banker plant system for it. Mm -hmm. So a couple more questions that we can get to and we're going to get out of here before 10 after. Um, from Kylie Martin, what are predatory might what are, excuse me, what are predatory mites usually shipped in? Is there any reason to concern oneself with issues such as cross-contamination with mildew or fungus that could negatively affect the crops? And uh, they meant predatory mites. Suzanne, you got to do that. Yeah. Uh, so we've been using predatory mites. I mean, I've been working with them for 30 years and this has not been a problem. And they even have a longer history. You know, we've been using predatory mites predominantly in food crops. That's really where this kind of started. Tomatoes, arbergine, uh, cucumbers, things like that. So um, if there was a problem with that, we would have seen it there. Um, they are very, there, there's a lot of information and actually the AMBP has information available about carrier information, but basically it's all been tested. It's not a problem. If you're worried about it though, um, there's lots of new release methods um, like you can get from BioB straight phytocelis persimilis now with no carrier. It's expensive in a way because you're just getting a lot of persimilis per bug. It's not necessarily more expensive, but uh, you can mix it up in your own carrier if you want. Also, there's lots of release methods now between the vials, the sachets, where you never have to put the carrier actually on the plant. So you kind of have to look at which beneficial, what are your release options. Um, now we'll have to say, um, if you're coming to the Cultivate show this summer in July, the workshop on Saturday morning, we're gonna be doing a whole release hands-on workshop out in a greenhouse, going through all these different types of carriers, release methods, packaging and things like that. But it's nothing to worry about. I think that's a good answer. And just because I really wanna make sure that we shout out Cody Hitchcock from Smokey's Cannabis Company in the great Northern part of Colorado. All right, Whitney. Answer yeah. the last question. Hey, Cody. Um, the, um, so the, your question is, we've seen cannabis aphid. Let me see. Uh, so we've seen cannabis aphid eggs indoors. And I didn't get to talk about the life history of cannabis aphid, but, but that is one uh, that will produce eggs uh, when you get uh, short, uh, you get shortening of uh, uh, day length. So outdoors, we start to see males and sexual form females around the 10th of September, which gets to, which is about 13, 13, or excuse me, 12, 12 um, uh, light. Uh, so it's possible that they, you know, obviously you've seen it, uh, they, they, they can occur indoors. Your question, your interesting question, uh, the others can't, can't see the question is, is Will the eggs hatch in an indoor grow, or is there a vernalization period? Meaning, if an aphid has produced an egg, does there need to be a cold period for a certain amount of time 
to allow the eggs to hatch. And I think probably there is, but it's not known. And uh, um, I, I, uh, I, I, you said you, you know, they, they disappear, you don't seem to see them. So I think, I think it's likely if you're keeping the temperatures up, even if you get some egg production from a cannabis aphid, and uh, also if you remove the top row, the eggs of, of cannabis aphid are gonna be laid on, on the uh, above ground parts of the plant. And if you're removing it during harvest, then the eggs are pretty much gone. In, in, unless uh, some have maybe dropped on the ground, but very few would, will drop on a on a green plant uh, like you're harvesting. So anyway, I don't know if they vernalize or not. Uh, that's one of the, a whole bunch of questions that I wish we knew about the basic biology of some of these uh, insects on this crop, uh, particularly the ones that are only found on cannabis sativa, like hemp russet mite and cannabis aphid. Um, those are only found on on this one species. And Whitney, and I know we've talked about this. I mean, I've seen a ton of eggs now in cannabis, and I've never seen any hatched eggs. I've never seen any newly hatched aphids near the eggs. Um, and I, I, I agree with you. Now, I've had a few weird situations where people have taken their harvested plants and they throw them in the compost pile outside in northern environments. You got to be careful with that because then that will give them that cooling period. Um, most likely that will allow them to hatch. And I think that's what you've seen in that, like the wild hemp, Whitney, out there in Colorado. But I don't consider it an issue. Um, I'm real interested to see, though, if lacewing larvae would like to eat those eggs as a food source. Um, I'm not sure if, if I can sh uh, share this screen here, but the, uh, let me see it right here. I'm just going to do this right here. Uh, you are screen sharing. It's up, it's up now. Okay, and then just, uh, just, I mean, the cannabis aphid eggs hatch. I mean, the outdoors. I mean, they survive outdoors, and then they, uh, when you get little seedlings coming up from the, the uh, overwintering ones, the eggs that hatch move to the, the volunteers. I mean, they, I, in early April last year, they, there was snow, and the the, the the hemp was getting colonized by uh, aphids that had hatched outdoors. But that doesn't happen indoors um, because, uh, again, uh, that's you. Uh, don't have the uh, cool, you don't have the cool period uh, in an outdoor. So, so Cody's question is a really good one, anyway. Thank you, Whitney. Yep, yeah, good. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for attending. Um, we appreciate it and we especially appreciate our speakers who took their time and um, we appreciate their willingness to share their expertise with us. Um, if you guys have any questions or follow-up, we'll send a follow-up email to, to all the attendees. Um, but if you have any questions, you can reach out to Ben or I. Um, and with that, have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.